Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00 and to continue our deep dive into this Fractures universe surrounding the Eagle Strike armor, we're going to dive into the story shards The Last Sky Marshal Part 1, 2 and 3, all of which have already been released over on Halo Waypoint, written by Alex Haruspis Wakeford, and it's a story set in a Fractures universe of the main Halo universe. Again, to quickly summarize the overarching lore of this Fractures universe, the Entrenched Fracture is a world scourged by super science, aether bombs, and alchemically enhanced soldiers. Though its lands are ruined, the Unified Nations Security Confederation fights on in blind obedience to orders from long dead generals. Their sworn foes, the Zealots of the Covenant, survive only as hordes of radiation poisoned mutants bickering over the remnants of their once proud civilization. Survival on the front lines require Eagle Strike energized plate a marvel of warsmithing that protects against both radiation and Covenant Plasmatron weaponry. Fratches universes share a variety of the common elements with the core cannon, but can be recast in a different light or interpreted in a different way, and while they maintain the key touchstones remaining authentic to Halo, they also offer a unique what-if alternative universe look. Part 4 of The Last Sky Marshal is released on Tuesday the 27th, just a couple of days time with part 5 following thereafter. I'll probably make a separate episode covering those two parts as they're shaping up to be a pretty dramatic close. But in the meantime, let's dive into parts 1, 2 and 3 of The Last Sky Marshal. Ten forty-five hours, November 3rd, 67 AP. SCS Brissing Armand, approaching construction dome on Luna. Corporal, would you please describe the manner in which we will be engaging the enemy? Sir, feet first, sir. A chorus of oohrahs sounded across the deck as Commander Colby and his battalion prepared to drop. Cocooned within their vacuum-sealed, titanium-plated armour, it was the Sky Marshals that would, as always, take the lead as the Brizzing Armand, the frigate-class Zeppelin and last spacefaring vessel of the United Nations Security Confederation, opened its deployment bays. Colby's training kicked in as 300 Sky Marshal Astro Rangers leapt out of the skyship and headed towards the steel dome surrounding the complex on the moon, firing their thrusters to rocket through gaps in the dome's plating from some previous battle early in the war that left this place derelict, plastered over now by Arcanotech energy barriers. That was the easy part. Entering the vacuum sealed interior of the dome revealed almost two square kilometers of factories, warehouses, and long abandoned workshops extending outwards on all sides from its magnificent centerpiece, their target, Project Perpetua. The mission was simple. The Covenant, zealous cultists who became warped abominations as they were mutated by the radiated trenches and poisoned mires of Earth, had discovered an abandoned Cosmodrome with functional off-world transport. Arriving at Luna, they reignited the dormant atomic piles to complete construction of Project Perpetua, a massive zeppelin that was in the process of being built in the earliest years of the war. The SCS Perpetua was to be a shining symbol of hope for humanity's recovery after the end of the last war, but no one had truly understood the scale of devastation that was on the horizon. Spoiled lands, divided nations, aether bombs, Civilization itself collapsed, but humanity could not rely on the mercy of a short apocalypse. The inertia of that destruction was still carrying the corpse along through this final war. Now, the Covenant planned to augment this Zeppelin with their own esoteric arcano technology and unleash it upon humanity. In the last war, Commander Colby and his alchemically augmented Sky Marshals were also looked upon as symbols of hope and heroism but they would find no time to rest when the conflict had seemingly abated. The lights of democracy guttered in the wind as the Covenant cultists raised cities to the ground, leading the hard-pressed SCS command to ensure that the Sky Marshal service would continue, culminating in this mission which could determine the outcome of the final war. They were to either claim the Perpetua themselves and turn it on the Covenant mutants, or, failing that, detonate the atomic reactor used to power it, and leave a new crater on the moon. But first, they had to take out the Covenant's Archon Sky Strikers, or else, should the dome open for the Covenant to launch the Perpetua, Brizzing Armand would be shredded by the Arcanotech-augmented machine cannons. 
and if they had to destroy the Perpetua, they'd have no way off this rock. An errant Arcanotech bolt impacted and dissipated on Colby's jackknife torso armour, an energised plate that had added an extra few dozen kilos but ensured maximum front-facing protection. Colby raised his rifle and fired as his triple X aero visor tracked the bolt's trajectory, hitting his thrusters once more to propel himself at the line of jackal merc mutants. The creatures hid behind iron shields fashioned from the eagle strike armor of fallen warriors, but it did them little good. Catching one of the mutants in the side, dark green blood sprayed onto the ground as three of Colby's fellow sky marshals. Chen, Chakova, and Vickers arrived in formation to assist in the attack on the Archon, breaking through the first line. Eighteen of their number hadn't made it, either killed by the impact or by the entrenched Covenant mutant forces. They all knew what they were fighting for and how thin the margin for error was. Every soldier lost was one less chance they had to win the day for humanity. Colby comforted himself with the thought that their odds were improving as his squad of Sky Marshals destroyed the first Archon battery with a satchel of CX-12 explosive. Scanning the horizon, Colby tracked three other local Archon emplacements which the other Sky Marshals were converging on, and beyond them, the Covenant-occupied factory. Within that facility lay their prize. At that moment, Colby's Cosmicon radio picked up a local signal, but this wasn't from his Sky Marshals. Somebody else was here. Hello, is the man da? The voice that came through his Cosmicom spoke in German, which Colby cursed that he couldn't translate. This is Commander Colby of the United Nations Security Confederation. Identify yourself. UNSC? Here? Er ist Professor Henrik Glassmann, Dritt Abteilung. Sieht dem das Dinger her angekommen? Sind halben wir uns dem Bunker wo chance? Just a resurgency rein zu kommen. Ich hab Sibylisten bei mir. Familien. Colby gritted his teeth. They hadn't come for a rescue mission, and they'd certainly not had intelligence on any remaining civilians on Luna. But one thing stood out in what Glassman had said. Dritt Abteilung. Section 3. Scientists, especially those affiliated with Section 3, had been marked as high-value personnel. They were critical to understanding the Covenant's arcanotech, plundering the myriad secrets of their cult, and advancing humanity's own military hardware. A thousand tactical questions rushed through his mind. Was this unexpected complication an opportunity? Could it be a trap? How many could feasibly be retasked for a rescue op? What intelligence might Glassman have that could aid the mission? He took a breath to focus himself. The choice was clear. All right, Commander Colby spoke into his Cosmicon. I don't know if you can understand me, but hold tight. I'm on my way. Sir, what are you doing? Chikova asked. I need you, Chen, and Vickers to hold this position while I secure a high-value asset. If we need help dealing with Perpetuous Atomic Reactor, this could be exactly what we need. Though the Sky Marshal was clearly conflicted by this sudden change in the mission's parameters, she nodded and rocketed up to higher ground to take up Overwatch with her sniper rifle. Glassman had remained silent on the Cosmocom, but transmitted a waypoint to his HUD, directing him to a nearby bunker. Two mechanised steel doors built into a thick, slanted concrete box opened as he approached, inviting him below. I'm coming in, Professor. Have your people ready. As Colby headed down, he picked up the noise of hustle and bustle echoing up from within the vault. The sounds of dozens of feet stamping about, excited chatter, boxes and crates being moved and thumped down onto the ground with haste, perhaps setting up a defensive perimeter in case of a breach. That was good. The word civilian was one that hadn't been used for years, for it had come to lose all meaning in this total, all-consuming war. At last he arrived in the central vault chamber, its domed ceiling illuminated by small lights running along a thick, wooden beam that spanned the length of the room, approximately 15 metres in diameter and crudely sectioned off with various rooms, a kitchen, living quarters, workstation, and a closed door at the far end of the room that was surrounded by candlelight. Colby tightened his grip on the rifle as he saw no sign of anyone around, yet the sound of activity persisted. The floor was scuffed with boot prints, carpets were torn up, people had to have been there. He listened closely, slowly making his approach towards the living quarters where the sound tracker of his triple X aero visor seemed to be picking up the noise source. Aware that every second he was spending down here meant anything could be happening on the lunar surface. As Colby pushed into the living quarters he felt a sudden impact strike his helmet and whirled to the side, weapon raised, 
to see a gaunt man in a white lab coat with mousy, golden hair. He held his hands up and shook them. Nick Sieben, ein in moment. After a few seconds, a second voice in Colby's head repeated. Don't shoot, one moment. Professor Glassman? He asked. Yeah, he responded, pointing at Colby's helmet, his voice now just about synchronizing with the English translation. I put earwig device on your head. Let us understand each other. Professor, where the hell is everyone? You said there were civilians down here. Colby glanced over to a wooden table in the corner and spotted a disc spinning on a record player. Lifting the needle, the sound of commotion ceased. Oh, they are here, Commander, he said, beckoning Colby over. Let us head to the chamber beyond. I think they are nearly finished. Glassman scurried over to the door, surrounded by candles, and as Colby approached, he saw the names had been scratched into the wall. Barton, Dubbo, Endisha, Magnusson. There were dozens, and Colby felt his blood run cold as Glassman smiled at him, opening a slat on the door and peering inside. It's unfortunate we had to skip the pleasantries and get straight to business, Commander, Glassman said. We had hoped to delay you a little longer, and that you would have brought your squad with you, but no matter. The leader of the valiant Sky Marshals will do. Colby raised his rifle once again, aiming squarely at Glassman's head. What the hell have you done? They made me offer you the chance to surrender. Glassman did not turn to face him, but continued eagerly staring at the process of whatever was happening within. Those mutant cultist freaks actually made a deal with you. Uh, they came here? Told me what they truly seek is to be unbound from our mortal concepts of good and evil? Of laws and morals? The old ones, their technology, will lead the Covenant to their third life. As man, as mutant, and as what comes next with their wisdom teaches us all new ways to revel in this great journey. Their grace will smother the earth and with the star zeppelin complete, they will go on to effect universal change in time. This kindness to join them, they offer. Colby pressed the barrel of his rifle to the back of Glassman's head. Do you even hear yourself? How the hell did they turn you with talk like that? Glassman remained unfazed. We have been here for a long, long time, Commander. We offered no resistance when they came, and their prophets offered us salvation. If you wish to see the choice the others made, simply step into the radiation chamber. They're all in there, waiting. And you? They knew they would be followed here and needed someone to delay your progress. He turned now, holding out his hands to Colby. But we can end this now. We shall step into the chamber together, join the others, and begin the great journey. In all his years of fighting, Colby had seen much of what the worst of humanity had to offer, both in the form of the Covenant cultists and mutated abominations, and the United Nations Security Confederation itself. It had almost seemed easy to go numb to it all, as the world descended into base depravities in the name of long dead generals and covenant dogma, but this, a new world of deeper, darker horrors, waited just beyond those doors, and Colby could stop them from opening. Time was up. He had to return to his squad, resume the fight to secure the Perpetua, deliver a crushing final victory against the horror that had taken root here, but first, there was the matter of the unarmed monster before him, Henrik Glassman. Colby could gun him down and be done with it, or leave the twisted scientist here, maroon him on Luna to live out whatever remained of his life with no hope of escape. He wondered which would be more just, but like civilian, the word justice had long faded out of use. Commander Colby steadied his breathing. This isn't a human being, he told himself as he looked Henrik Glassman in the eye. This is an enemy, a traitor, a monster. But even after all these years of endless, ever escalating conflict, executing an unarmed man always seemed like an excessive depravity. When he eventually fell, be it in this battle or the next, Commander Colby had no doubt that he'd be seeing Glassman again. He exhaled slowly and found his resolve to do what needed to be done. You hesitate, Glassman said, grinning as he made to turn his back to the Sky Marshal. Perhaps I can make this easy for you. Blood splattered the door to the radiation chamber. Glassman fell to the floor with a dull thump, and Commander Colby did not look back as he exited the bunker to return to the lunar surface. The consequences of his off-mission detour were made almost immediately apparent as he arrived back where he'd ordered his team to hold position. The rocky, uneven ground was strewn with over a dozen corpses. Bulbous, 
unseeing eyes belonging to a group of jackal merc mutants staring blankly up at the dome over their heads, their skin sickly and pale, and Colby's wrist-mounted battle pad began updating his HUD with the tactical overview of what he'd missed. Vickers was the first of his sky marshals he saw splayed on the ground, crumpled at an unnatural angle with the unmistakable markings of an arcana blade slashed across his chest. Chen was not far from him. It was clear that he had taken the same blade through the abdomen and been lifted off his feet, tossed aside like nothing. Chakova was still moving, barely. It seemed she had fallen from a great height, shot down from her overwatch position, and her armor was severely warped from the combined effect of arcana fire. She was injured, but in the dusty half-dark it was impossible to know how badly. Colby hurried over, his heavy steps churning the ground. It didn't matter. The closer he got, the worse the damage looked. They both knew it was too late. Jacoba shakily grasped Colby's wrist, squeezing hard until her strength failed. And then she was gone. Colby was alone. He stood for a moment in silent contemplation of his fallen team, not yet able to feel the loss of those with whom he'd fought for countless years. For if he were to lower that barrier now, he would surely join them. He replaced that tremor of guilt with blame, knowing he'd made a mistake going down into that bunker, and that blame then transformed into responsibility. Make their loss worthwhile. A thunderous explosion tore through the dome complex, rousing Colby back to a state of combat-ready alertness. Sky Marshals, he spoke into the comm, report in. Secondary target destroyed, Commander. Marshal Aiken responded. Significant casualties sustained, but it looks like we've got the mutant bastards in retreat. Standing by for orders? Colby's visor updated with the report. 300 of them had dropped. 18 had died on the way down. A further two dozen had fallen in the fighting since. And the destruction of the secondary reactor complex had flash vaporized 75 more. We move on the primary objective, Marshal Aiken, Colby responded. We either claim or destroy the main facility and the Perpetua. Nothing else matters now. Affirmative, sir. We'll regroup. Marshal Aiken paused as the main facility displayed signs of activity. Something was coming out of the pipes. A dark purple cloud began to spread in all directions through the dome complex, clawing its way towards the Sky Marshals like some kind of vengeful apparition. This weapon was a relatively recent development for the Covenant. For one thing, it was capable of shorting out communication equipment, but it was the effects it had on people that were said to be truly terrifying, affecting each victim differently with seemingly no logical rhyme or reason in its distinction. Despite his years of experience, Commander Colby had never actually encountered the Covenant's crawling mists before, but he had heard the stories of what these weaponized nanoclouds were capable of, and that meant he had to act fast. Colby looked down at the two fallen Sky Marshals closest to him. He'd long hated the idea of using the equipment of his fallen comrades, but that principle was just another luxury that they didn't have on the battlefield. Both Chakova and Chen had equipped their helmets with an additional attachment. The more antiquated nature of the Sky Marshal battle rig systems and design meant that only one could be equipped at a time. Chakova had opted for specialized nocturne goggles that would help with visibility, but Chen's gummy tube filter had been created as a specific countermeasure for the Covenant's crawling mists to, at least in theory, stave off some of its potential effects. With the mists drawing closer, Colby had to make his mind up on what he was going to equip now. So that rounds out parts 1, 2, and 3 of The Last Sky Marshal, and a hell of a cliffhanger it was too. Part 4 releases tomorrow, the 27th, but I'll be holding off until part 5 releases to give the last two parts of The Last Sky Marshal this kind of treatment. So, in the meantime, thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below, and I look forward to what you have to say. And quick shout outs and thank yous to my patrons. Spartan10148, my devastatingly effective Metarch class at Scylla. Silver Spartan, Leon, Ram, Prophet Bear, and Irrefutable Justice, my ever vigilant monitors. The careful tending of Alvin, Andrew, Brian, Cameron, Darian, Devon, Phantom, Flaming Halo, Cabal, Legions Lost, Michael, Spartan0137, The Cave Potato, and Wolf Eclipse, my sub monitors. My growing fleet of Strato Sentinels and my most loyal of enforcers, 
and all my awesome Sentinels, Sentries and Constructors who have jumped aboard on Patreon to help support the channel. You have my debt of gratitude. And, as ever, Todd Morrison, my Tier Zero Transcentient YouTube member. Thanks for keeping my installation running on that glorious vacuum energy. Remember to like, comment and subscribe, as it all helps the channel grow and helps me to continue to deliver this kind of content for you guys. And if you're ready for your next steps in evolution, head over to Patreon and become a patron there or become a YouTube member to attain a higher state of being. Much love to all of you, take it easy everyone, and find peace in the domain.